month, in one week You will sing a new song In two days, unless you're done You will hear Congratulations, you're sitting Productivity development in the new normal. We have a lot of people. We have from terms of industries, mines, and agriculture. We have professors. We have scholars of different disciplines here. We even have students. It's a variety of different classes here in Godfrey Okoye University for the events. And we are going to look forward to a lot because definitely it's going to be educative, it's going to be knowledgeable, it's going to be interactive, it's going to be interesting. So join me as we go into the auditorium to be part of this great event. My name is Mona Ezzard. Yes, I'm the author of the book and uh, what really inspired me to write uh, the productivity development book with the manual, the practical manual, is the fact that um, there are so many, um, uh, so many uh, challenges we need to overcome. Uh, the challenge of busy doing nothing, uh, the challenge of um, walking like elephant and eating like ant, uh, the challenge of uh, living a planless life. So we, uh, I, I got um, you know, inspired that we need to give this book as a gift to our world, especially the corporate world, uh, and of course the families, the individuals, everybody needs this book to schedule, to plan, to set goals, to be able to increase the level of achievements and decrease the level of wastes. So that's really what inspired us to write this book. So what are we supposed to expect at today's event? Are there expectations from the guests and uh, what should we take home after today's event? Okay, um, the expectations are quite um, numerous. One is that we are going to unveil the book and it will now be ready for use by the public, individuals, corporate organizations, governmental offices. The book will officially be unveiled today. Then as uh, the course, because the book is also a course that is already being offered in Gofrio Koye University as a professional certificate course. So the course takes effect from today. And uh, other universities that may wish to also have this course some of them are already here they've applied to have us uh, um, institute this course in their institutions we are going to officially make it open for people to say come and do this course in our universities again uh, people will also assess the book today you can buy and you know for your workers for yourselves and all that um, there will also be an eye-opening thought-provoking keynote speech that will be delivered by a renowned professor, Professor Ken Ife, who will now, you know, discuss and open our eyes on the need for productivity development. So uh, there are so many takeaways. And of course, the secretariat of the center that is uh, in charge of this um, uh, program, they are here with their forms. People can actually enroll into the course right from this very venue. So there are so many takeaways. Welcome you all to this very important summit from public book presentation with the theme, Productivity Development 
the new normal. One of the greatest gifts of God to, you, to humanity is the gift of productivity and creativity. God created human beings in his image. And the human nature expresses this fact of God's creation through human productivity and in creativity. In other words, human productivity is an expression of being created in the image of God. Productivity and creativity are connected in the sense that human productivity is always of a creative nature. In other words, creativity brings about productivity and productivity expresses human creativity. In the course of history, human beings have organized their productive activities in different ways to achieve maximum productivity. Political systems, economic systems, cultural systems and social systems have always been organized to enhance human level and productivity. This summit, therefore, is very important because it goes to present and discuss something that is very essential to our life as humans. A productive society is a living society. And a society without productivity dies. The topics are centered on different areas of productivity the power of preparation and productivity, time management for productivity, goal setting for productivity, daily planning for productivity, team building for productivity, and so on. The whole idea is to discuss productivity in such a way that one can see different ways of improving human productivity. It is our hope that the participants will gain deep insight into how human productivity can be promoted. This very important summit is useful in our society this time more than any other time. Besides, productivity is not only about physical things, it is also about spiritual things. In fact, anything that borders on the output of human creativity an aspect of human productivity. Finally, I recommend a book written by engineer Henry Dukawurego for use by individuals and corporate bodies to improve on human productivity and all other aspects that will promote creativity and productivity. There was a, a photographer who traveled to Omaha with his uh, little son. And of course, the subject of today we are dealing with productivity. Why productivity? Because we want to feel our stomach, we want to be productive, we want to produce enough to go around within a time frame. So the little boy was uh, harassing, asking his father, well, very childish questions, but very pertinent. Say, does God live in this government house? The father will say yes. He asked other questions and then finally he said, Does God live in my stomach? The father said, Yes, 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 God lives in your stomach. Allow me to do my work. So at the end of the ceremony, they were just leaving uh, the premises and the little boy saw a lady carrying a basket of bananas. And he said, Daddy, 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 he hit his stomach. Remember, he, he was told that God lives in his stomach. He said, Daddy, Daddy, God is hungry, he did some bananas. <laughs> you know, uh, children sometimes uh, middle. Uh, some of the things we have us take for granted that they are very, very important. So we are very grateful to the planning committee uh, of today's event. Um, I can see from there Professor Ken Ife, who is the chairman of the steering committee, 
Henry. Engineer Henry Loka Awaregu, the program director. Dr. Mrs. Blessing Anuke. She is uh, the chair of the Senate Committee, or Ceremonies Committee. Honorable Frederick Ozilo, Chairman LOC. Mrs. Ijere Sandra Sochima, the event manager. Today, I want you to relax. Professional students and their tutors, business entrepreneurs. So I'd like you to really sit back and enjoy yourself and make today for this evening. The man of the moment, Reverend Father Professor. Christian and Eke, a big applause for our Vice Chancellor. This is the most welcome. Uh, my name is Comedian Francis. I've heard a lot about you. I hope you don't mind. So I want to come and have a handshake with you, sir. <laughs> so, you know, if I tell my young people that I know you, they will not believe. So, sir, please, I hope you don't mind to stand up. Sir, where is the camera? Where is my phone? You need a great job, sir. We appreciate what you're doing. I'm not even going to see you all. Thank you, sir. I need that picture. Thanks, of Reverend Father Professor Christian Anyeke. One of the greatest gifts of God to humanity is the gift of productivity and creativity. God created human beings in his image. And human nature expresses this fact of God's creation through human productivity and creativity. In other words, human productivity is an expression of being created in the image of God. In our world today, there is certainly no sufficient time to do everything you have to do. That is why we all need a practical manual and guides such as this timely book titled Productivity Development, written in texts and practical workbook and currently offered as a professional certificate course in Godfrey Okoye University. The aim is to enable us handle our time management complications by becoming more productive. No matter how many personal productivity techniques you master, there will always be more to do than you can ever accomplish at the time you have available for you. Therefore, to be more productive and achieve greater results, you simply need to have this book and enroll into the course. Every family needs this course for the growth and success of each member of the family. It was mission, which is my employer. And as last night, just in the evening, I had ruled out all possibilities of coming down here at all. From the, from the vice chancellor of giving me an ultimatum. If I'm not here, this program will be cancelled and he's not coming. So I had to tell my people, just get me the ticket, I will not find my way to get to Abuja early this morning. So I have been coming here, it's such a pleasure that I'm here. I also have to thank Linus because Linus is the Linus is the, the GFO, the head of the Development Finance Division of Central Bank. Very, very dynamic man. I'm really pleased that he's here because when I saw him in the in the Dos States and he told me all the tens of billions of naira that he's been raising for them, I said you are coming to lose here. And you have to come to lose here. And since coming here, since coming here, he's visited more than 50 communities and he's tried it. But I said to him, we have to answer some query about the uh, God for Okoye University. We have to make sure that we show a, a good example of tertiary institution working with Central Bank on some of our agenda. So we can make the case. Let me speak to this topic. Because it's very important, and I'm glad that you're all here. From the Dosoya. And my other good friend uh, is here as well, the uh, Lotri uh, uh, President General. Uh, now, the, the, the crux of this matter on productivity is that if you don't plan to succeed, obviously you have planned to fail. Hmm? You don't have a plan to succeed in your business, then you actually have a plan to fail. That's a, a normal saying that people would say. And so, what does that tell you? It brings you to the idea that you have to plan. And planning 
It's a rigorous process, and it's a process that is for everyone. There's nothing you do, whether it's institution or university or government, you have to plan. And, and even I didn't I didn't I never do the right answer. That one of the things I do is to go around the universities and prepare them on strategic planning courses. I think the, the last one was Defense Academy. Uh, I'm also a visiting professor in Defense Academy. But they have to tell you what is their goal. One of their goals is to be the, among the best 10 universities in Nigeria. Hmm? But there has to be another goal, because that is one thing you may want to do. But what is purpose of your education at the university is to promote achievement. In other words, to make sure that people learn. In other words, your students learn. And when you want to say learn, what are the indicators you are going to use to measure that? You have to measure recruitment, you have to measure progression, you have to measure achievement, you have to measure retention. So I now have those two goals to work the whole university through that process. But that's the same thing. So everything I'm going to say here is they do it, everybody does it, government does it. So bear in mind, so the issue about strategic planning for your business is one thing. The second thing is you have resources that you have to work with. One of the resources is human capital development. You have human capital. There are many countries in the world that don't produce anything. They just, I mean Japan, tell you what meaning that they have. But share human capacity, investment in share human capacity, make them what they are. The third or fourth largest economy in the world. That's why you have all the technology, electronics, cameras, and all of that. Coming from Japan. Then, we'll talk about that. The second one, the third thing is physical resources. So what physical resources are you going to deploy for your production or for your service delivery? What of them is infrastructure. And then you hear all that story, many of you who sit on the television, I talk about the infrastructure a lot. With infrastructure, you can't get any business to come and invest in your country only for them to borrow money and come here and start using that money to build the infrastructure. They are borrowing their money to come and do the business and make money. So, in anything you are going to do, there has to be some infrastructure that needs to be developed or put in place. And some of them are trunk infrastructure, like highway, like seaport, like airport, and all of that. Some are arterial infrastructure that connects to the trunk. If you say trunk A road, what about trunk B, how about the road? Then you have specialized infrastructure, which is the one that is specialized and focusing on the kind of business that you need. Some of them would be, well, we need the ICT, the you know, Lima Container Depot, and whatever it is. Then there's another one that is called quality infrastructure. Now that is the one that I held Nigeria to the ground. And I'm sure Mr. Arno just will connect with me on that. Quality infrastructure is simply the reason why we can't export. And those who try to do that get rejection and get sent back to your face. Unfortunately, I was a food commissioner in London for three years. And over that period, I was only busy going to the court to defend and you know our people who bring them off other monkey all kinds of things and they get arrested and applied in the court. The issue is this, the 1999 uh, Health and Safety Act, European Health and Safety Act, banned 80% of all known chemicals, agrochemicals and all that, 80%. And nobody knows which one they are. And all I know is that they are putting everything they think on the, on the, on the crops. Fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides, monocytes, administrative. And when the residue tests are done on those things, they will find all those that are banned. And they contain carcinogenic substances that cause cancer. So there are organometallic substances or mercury or all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of education that got to go in. There are a bit more things connected to this. And there have various levels of certification and test laboratory testing and all kinds of things. Analysis, there are so also that are all called quality infrastructure. That they enable you to deliver even certifications, ground level certification. The good agricultural practice, manufacturing level certification, which is the uh, GMP, good manufacturing practices. The one of them is HACCP, hazard analysis of physical control. Board. And then you come to sanitary and phytosanitary. As you go up, quality in front of all. You have to be mindful of those because why would you want the white man to trust you to bring any food for them to eat? You poison them now. So they want to know that you are conforming to those minimum standards that can be verified 
and or for, for what they are doing, how to buy from you to eat. Then, when you go through those three, uh, you come to one that is called the government. What is the role of government? Government is has to provide an enabling environment, but here they want to do everything. They don't want to run the agriculture for you. <laughs> and you see me taking taking on government on agriculture because uh, we got it wrong. And then I hear people see the reason why agriculture is not working is because oil really brought to dodgy disease and oil has nothing to do with it. And you all know, it, before we had this war, we had we had people during the regions. We had the regions doing well, you had granite pyramid, you had oil, you had the cocoa and all that. They were actually being run by the regions. And so they were getting 50% of the revenue back. And then even at some point it went to 100 and then it came down again to 50%. But as soon as we got into the oil business, the only place they were allowing derivation is on oil and gas and solid mineral. So they blew away that incentive to the states, to the regions and states. So if you're taking away the incentive, what do you want the state to do? Where every state you have thousands and thousands of hectares of farmland plantations, they have abandoned all of that. What you now had was a big board called Federal Ministry of Agriculture, and they're, they're doing everything. And when you ask a farmer, uh, what is your problem in agriculture? They'll tell you, oh, we don't have feeder road, we don't have dam. Even where you have dam, you don't have water, you don't have the aquaculture, you don't have what producing for me, and then I, I don't have seed and the fertilizer. And then they use hunt and the storage. And then you have st strategic drill reserve. You know those gigantic silos built in most, most states. What are they? They're empty. They still have to pay to maintain them. But they're empty. And then you have 400 dams. Where are they? Tell me count how many dams are being used for power generation. Or which ones are being used for irrigation. Which ones are being used for. So you just have that. That what you call agricultural development program. Two farmers that sit down and grow the crop can't get the seed. They can't get the fertilizer. Yes, you have. Hundreds of billions used for their crop to buy the thing, they will send to states. You know that some commissioners just sell those, those, those trailers of fertilizer. So the man that actually needs the money to grow the crop is sitting down there waiting. By the time the seed arrives to him and fertilizer, the season is over. So this, this is not sustainable. So you don't blame oil. Oil has nothing to do with it. We disincentivize agriculture. And we refuse from a government-led program to deal with the critical issue facing the what I call the last mile. The last mile is the farmer. So when in 2017, you see the government decided that we've had enough because we can't we went into stagflation and we couldn't manage our way out. He tried devaluation, right? He devalued first, the value second bit, it didn't work. He tried macro prudential measures. You, you go to the bank, you can't even get your dollar. You want to put some dollar, they, they don't, they don't like you. So people, business people are taking their money where Ghana must go to go and order from Ghana and pay from Ghana. I mean, that became unsustainable. Then they now tried capital account control, where people who have invested in stocks and shares and all that stuff can't get their money because it's, it's, it's supposed that also, you know, you can get your money. They're telling them stories, wait for one month. So, that was at the point when JP Morgan started to visit Nigeria and the back and all of that. So you, you had enough, tried everything. They go to say, okay, you know what? Well, we, what the hell are we using this money to buy? The government was seeing the money, the revenue, dollar revenue, go down from $3.2 billion a month down to $1 billion. But the request for exports, not for imports, was $4.6 billion. So you are earning $1 billion, and you are asking me to bring 4.6 for you to import what? Toothpick, any food you can talk about. So we have said to man, you know, these guys, you should go and eat what you produce, or produce what you eat. Ten value chains, just go and do it. It's not when he gives you or he leaves you. So that's why they delisted those for three items. But it is not enough to delist these things and then sit back in. The country will be in chaos. So they now decided to intervene seriously to agriculture. And now let me, let's, let's have a discussion on this. How did they intervene? They called all the, all the, all the, all the uh, CFO, sorry, the CEOs of all the banks, they call them bankers committee. And they start around and said, okay, what do we do? You are private sector, we want you to help private sector, we are the farmers. What do we do? They said, well, you know, 
No bank wants to lend to agriculture, so you have to do this kind of agriculture. You set up um, NISA. All right? Put 500 million dollars NISA. You risk agriculture up to 8%, okay? <laughs> they now say, yeah, now we can start talking. But who do, who do you want to lend the money to? What do you know, know your customer? They want to know, know your from who? Who are we giving the money? They must have a biometric bank verification number. Hmm? That you are bringing artificial intelligence to the picture. So you can now have your picture, you have your fingerprints, it's called PVN. And once you've had it, there's no point. Every bank has to use it. All right? Okay. Then the bank say, okay, but, um, but where, where is the land we are lending the money to? You know, where is the evidence that they are going to plug it? We brought satellite technology. So we get the satellite uh, uh, footprint, coordinates of the land you say you are going to find. So it is on the computer screen, so they, the bank can see it. If you say you plant the image, they can go, ah, this is the But we thought it was over, they said, no, it's not over. What if we give them the money and they don't pay back? Then the bank had to go to the legislature to get a law, enabling law, for what they call GSI, Global Standard Instruction. So without Global Standard Instruction, it means if you fail to pay, the bank will notify Central Bank, and Central Bank can and sweep your account. Anywhere you have money in any of your account, it will sweep it. And then whoever guarantees you to sweep, to get the money. The banks became comfortable, now we are ready to do business. But they said, but, but how about, you know, in lending, you know, risk management, you know, you, know, you want to know how much money you're going to give somebody so that if it walks away, you don't break your heart. So they have to bring it down, bring it down. It's okay. One farmer, one hectare. Is it not? Because when you are lending on the basis of one farmer, one hectare, it's only about 200,000 for cassava to three or 400,000 for cotton and other. So it, the money involved is not that much. So we're not going to lose sleep. So we reduced it. And then what's the result? The result is that 4.8 million farmers have got loan with no collateral. The result is that 5.2 million hectares have been farmed. Most of it in the north. But you see the trouble we are going to make trying to get the southern government to, to key into this program. That's another story for another day. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then you see rice pyramids. And the people think they're not. It is real because these are parties. And eventually, because what happens is that they make sure that there's no money exchanging hands. Because if you carry 400,000 and give one farmer, they now will get that money back. Home. So, what we do is that we give them the inputs, standardized inputs, regulatory price, you know, you know, standard price. We we'll give them the mechanization that they want plowing of your land, 10,000 naira per hectare, ridging, 10,000 naira per hectare, harrowing, 10,000 naira per hectare. Then we know for one hectare of maize or rice, you need five bags of NPF, PV, fertilizer. NPK, NPK fertilizer. Four bags are required. Then urea, two bags of urea per hectare. Then fertilizer, two liters. Then herbicides. The sixth thing you know, you have pre and post. So we have, we know the money. Two percent of the money is for insurance. So if your crop fail, you just can't get it. If there's fraud, go and get your money. So you have all that. And then 10,000, 5,000 naira for extension support. So what is going to be coming out to see and to check. And then you have aggregators. Aggregators that will come, come and collect the food from you. So you don't have to trouble yourself. Somebody will come to your farm when you are ready and collect the thing. And they're not going to collect everything. You know. They only want to collect the quantity that pays your loan. So that's why if you have rice and you have a yield of six tons, you only need one ton or one and a half to repay your loan. The other ones are your own loan. And the aggregator will collect it and create it within three days into your account. So you don't have it. So it is all designed to make sure that this whole thing works for us. And you have seen the result. Alright. So in the same way, we have to make sure that the government provides an enabling environment for the business. Because that's what we want of government. And what are the enabling environments? Investment climate reform. Continue to you know, reform the investment climate to make it very friendly. And then secondly, the ease of doing business. You know, you know, let's be competitive. And when you look at the ease of doing business, about 10 of them, almost 
four, the four major ones rest on the state government. Is on registration of title. If you want to, your, your title, your land title, do and register it. Ease of uh, a construction permit, if you want to build, give you construction permit. Then uh, litigation on your title, how long does it take? And when you look at the figures there, you will see where an Enugu state is, uh, is at the bottom. Of, you know, some, one of these procedures will take you 300 days. You know, so we're going to make things easier. And that's what we say, enabling environment. And then, so the other thing part of the enabling environment is incentivize private sector. The private sector only works on incentive. You know, if you give them the incentive, they will work around the incentive and they'll deliver. But if you want to do processing, they will, they will, they will, it will be worse for you. So give them the incentives. And a lot of the incentives are physical incentives. And there are many of them. So it's ranging from infant industry protection to all that stuff. Even to the presidential law that says to the, the big boys, you know, I know, I know your pay. You pay hundreds of billions every year to tax and they don't see anything. So, okay, I can allow you to take half of that to your tax and then do the infrastructure, build the road to your factory. You know, what is that the is doing now, these other guys? So, they are now using their money, part of the tax, to actually do something that helps the business and helps the community. So, these are some of the things that you do expect uh, working with government to, to, to get. So, now, I need to talk a little bit about the very first one. The very first one, which is the strategic planning one, where you know, where the productivity really looms large, this is your productivity concept. If you want to plan, first you want to achieve, you want to know, define what goals they are. I've only given you some examples of the university system. And here I define two goals, and then all the processes that go with it. Once that goal is clear, the next one will be, you know, you know, vision of which bet. There is a mission component that tells you this is where you want to be, this is what you want to achieve, this is what you want to do. So how do you actually get there? Then you now have a set of objectives, which you call strategic objectives. Those objectives must be written in a language of SMART, S-M-A-R-T, which is um, specific, measurable, achievable, and whatever, time bound and all that, realistic and time bound. So once you've got that, there is a sequence they follow. You don't just script them, they follow a sequence. Because once you say goal one is to do this, then what objectives follow to do goal one? There may be objective one, objective two, that tells you how you really need to get to that. Then goal two, what ob some objectives are with objectives three and four and five. So, so it's written in that language. And then if you really want to take it further, to go far, you go to, you go to where we call results chain. In other words, when, and like when you have a, a, an objective, then you have to have a program that follows from that, and then you have a project that follows from that, and then you have activities that follow from that project. And you deliver it to activity. And once you have an activity, there must be an output connected to an activity. So you now have activity, you have output, and when you have output, then there must be an outcome. And if you have an outcome, then there must be an impact. So there must be a real change in your situation, in your productivity, if you follow these steps. So, we now come and have a table, the core logical framework, where you say result chain, where you capture all of that. You can see goal, objective, uh, project, that, the follow, and out. so you can see all of them. So, what, when you have this, you have a basis for monitoring and evaluation. So, you can monitor your workforce, you can monitor your production, so people can have a, you know, you have a scientific basis. If you don't do this, you won't be able to register the to your productivity. How do, you, how do you know that you have made a change in the human behavior? What training have you given the staff? What was your target objective in the training to achieve? And what, what, how do you measure it? Whatever you can measure, you can change. But if you don't measure anything, it's like working with civil servants. You give them a task, they have a budget. They just write a report, process, process. They never tell you output. There's nothing to measure. So, so that's, that's that. And then, in the, as, we are want, as we want to put it all together, you have to look at certain other rudiments that help you in, in defining this plan. Because first, you want to know who are your stakeholders that you are going to work with, who are going to impact on what you are doing. Eh? Then you look at yourself, what the cost, what am I? You look at yourself as a business. What are my strengths as a business? What is it that I'm offering? And what are my weaknesses as a business? And then, in the industry where they are playing a role, who are threatening, who are likely to threaten you or challenge you, 
and what so you look at threats and what are the other weaknesses. So you look at those four. It's called uh, strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. And then you can come and look at what they call um, personal analysis, which are things outside your control. And that's where government comes in. Now, technology is one, one of those. Because technology can suddenly change things. If you know what happened in 2020, technology can just change things, transform things overnight. So you must be you know, mindful of that. So when you are looking at resources, you look at um, the money, money part, the money part I didn't even talk about because at the end of the day, that capital, capital is money, money is part of capital. The human capital is the other one I was talking about. Then the third one is um, the resources, your physical resources, which is technology you're going to employ in business and infrastructure required for you to do the business. And then the, 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 the other external one, the other one is how you work with government to enable the environment in which you are operating. Summary, because I, I can't go on forever, you guys have been here for a long time. Then. Productivity is a very important thing. Productivity looks at different aspects of your business. If you are using deploying technology, you need to be able to measure the change that it brings. If you are using financial resources, you also have to look at all that. If you are looking at using human beings, of course you have to use human beings. These things don't work themselves. You also have to be mindful of the contribution that human beings make. So you must train those staff. You must do capacity development, you have to do planning of their, their thing selection. So all of the issues that come in in human resource development and management must kick in so that you have a better productive person that spends less time, does more, and you can have some time to yourself. Alright? I, I hope you know, you know that gives us some 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 I'll stand to the question. Give me any questions on this matter. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. You can do better than that. If you want to be productive, can we give you a round of applause? Thank you. Productivity refers to the ability to harness physical and human resources to generate output and income. It refers to an increase in the value of output produced for a given level of input over a specified period of time. Productivity is the key source of economic growth and competitiveness. A country's ability to improve its standard of living depends almost entirely on its ability to raise its output by working. Productivity is considered a key source of economic advancement and as such is basic statistical information for many international comparisons. From a, a broader perspective, increased productivity increases the power of an economy through driving economic, economic growth and satisfying more human needs. Mr. Hay in Dukas' book for productivity development, a simple guide to increasing personal and corporate achievement with little effort, is therefore a well thought out book and that tries to provide solutions to the problems of on the performance being witnessed in both private and public sectors in Nigeria. This book is very interesting that once we pick it up, there is this urge to continue to read and conclude the book. The book contains 12 chapters of various interesting topics on productivity development. The book has portion at the end of each chapter where the reader can test his understanding of the topic. This is a very commendable initiative. In chapter 1, he introduced and defined the term productivity. The term productivity and activity were differentiated also in this chapter. In the second chapter is where he discussed the importance and need for adequate preparation before productivity is achieved. He listed major factors that productivity people, that productive people focus on as one attitude and behavior too. It has to do with knowledge of what one wants and burning desire to achieve it. The difference between goal setting and planning was clearly discussed in chapter 6 of the book. Understanding and knowing how to apply the difference between planning and goal setting will be essential to success. The two terms sound interchangeable and are often mistaken for each other. The book clearly differentiated Goal is what you want to achieve, 
Why plan is how to achieve it? Simply put, good goals are the end result. Why plan shows how you get there. In chapter 7, the role and importance of team building for productivity were enumerated in this chapter. The importance of team building in improving productivity cannot be overemphasized. It unveils hidden potential by allowing people to utilize their, ta their talents. It creates new and beneficial experience and improves communication. Most importantly, this book stresses the, the Pareto principle as a guide to achieving productivity in chapter 8. This principle explains that 80% of your sources are being driven by 20% of your effort. There is need to identify the 20% of the effort that achieves that sources and concentrate on them for optimal results. Chapter 9 looked into the power of perspective in productivity. A good leader has a great role to play at improving productivity. The mark of a good leader is his or her ability to accurately predict the consequences of action and inactions. In chapter 10, the author also discussed the power of focus and concentration in productivity. According to him, focus, focus and concentration can be difficult to master, but efforts should be made to learn it by doing it despite distractions. The book encourages one to commence, continue, complete, and close tasks to assignment in chapter 11. It outlines the major reasons for delay and procrastination as the feeling of inadequacy, lack of confidence, or inability in key area of the task. The book encourages us to continue to continually upgrade our skills in key areas. Because no matter how good you are today, your knowledge and skills are becoming up to at a rapid rate. Continuous reading is the minimum requirement for success in any field. In the last chapter, the book finally dwelt on project management, which is a very important aspect of our life. Project management helps teams to organize track and execute work within the project. Heading to cash book, project development is timely. It takes care of the issue of inefficiency in carrying out one's assignment if well read and understood. His choice of word is commendable because he used clear and simple terms in the book. This makes the book easy to read and assimilate by, by scholars. We stand to call Avoided the use of ambiguous words, which is the bane of many, pub many pub publications, and the resultant effect is poor comprehension of the topic being discussed. Therefore, productivity development is simple, simply a must read for students, families, business managers, policy makers, and administrators. A good understanding of the book will help will be of great benefit in promoting both micro and macro components of the economy. Thank you. There is certainly no sufficient time to do everything you have to do. That is why we all need a practical manual and guide such as this timely book titled Productivity Development, written in text and practical workbook and currently offered as a professional certificate course in Godfrey Okoye University. The aim is to enable us to handle our time management complications by becoming more productive. No matter how many personal productivity techniques you master, there will always be more to do than you can ever accomplish at the time you have available for you. Therefore, to be more productive and achieve greater results, you simply need to have this book and enroll into the course. Every family needs this course for the growth and success of productivity. Team building for productivity. Pareto's 80-20 rule of productivity. The power of perspective in productivity. The power of focus and concentration in productivity. The four C's, comments, continue, complete and close in production to project management. The principle of daily use to schedule tasks and activities based on job roles, responsibilities, goals, plans,
Partners, tasks, locations, teams, and deadline situations. This is followed by 100 rules of productivity and day. Perry is a graduate of production technology, faculty of engineering and technology, Nam Yasikiwe University, Oka Anambra State. He equally did his master's degree in environmental technology, faculty of engineering and technology, Federal University of Technology, Oweri. He is a professional member of the National Industry Safety Council of Nigeria, as well as the British Project Professional Society, UK. Engineer Henry Ndoka Aure, who currently serves Enugu State Government as a member, Enugu State Technical Committee on Privatization and Commercialization. He is also an appointed member in the steering committee of Enugu State Appeals Project, World Bank Assisted. Henry is an entrepreneur development scholar and researcher with interest in digital trade and international commerce. He is the founder of WebLink Group, including Zimted World Class Limited, B2B Network Hub, and Green World Corporate Resources. Henry is the founding director of Enjoy Schools as well as the coordinator of East Corporate Org. He is the program lead for the International Scholars Center for Commerce and Industry, situated in some universities and other higher institutions of learning, including Godfrey Okoye University, Enugu, being headquarters of the center and where he serves as director in the Directorate of Continuing Education. He is married to his lovely wife, Barista Mrs. Emanuela Iforma Nduka, and the marriage is blessed with four wonderful children, Victory, Unique, Queen Esther, and King David. Henry Enduka Aurebu is a motivational speaker, teacher, human resource developer, management and corporate affairs consultant. He has participated in several conferences and trainings in Nigeria and overseas, including Austria-Nigeria based forum held in 2018 at Vienna, Austria. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, here is the long awaited tool needed to bridge the gap between activity and productivity. Here is the manual and guide towards greater achievement, greater turnover, profits, greater results. Here is the productivity development textbook and practical workbook. Which is for. 
Some will come to the university without any agenda. They have no plan. They just eat, come, and charge their phones and go back home. Okay? That's it. So, you have to become more productive. And how does the university grow? Through their individual effort. How does it, and how do we measure that we are growing? It's not just saying something, how do we measure that? We have a goal, we have some policies to implement our goal, and then at the end of the day, how do we measure the outcome of what we've done? That's exactly what the whole thing is all about. But I ask you, uh, there are some people who are unteachable. You know, with all your beautiful goals, with all your beautiful plans, outcome, everything, at the end of the day, there is zero output. Is it possible? That's my question to you before I invite the others to throw their questions. There is no way you have a clear goal with clear, smart objectives. Because when you write a goal, you know, the goal is like a vision, a dream. You dreamt about you were going to be in, in Jupiter, okay? Okay, that's fine. And that's where you, you want to be. Then the question is how you're going to get there. And then you mark various steps and objectives that, you, that will take you there. But there's no way you can have smart objectives that are going to deliver those goals. Because those objectives are going to be measurable. Yeah, if they're going to be measurable, they have to be smart. So they're going to be measurable. They're going to be very specific. It's not a wobbly statement. No, that I'm going to build this house in the next two years. You know, you, you have to be very specific. And they have to be time bound, because that's why I said yeah. And then you you know you have to be sure that it is realistic. Because if you're saying they're going to build this house, you're going to tell me later down where you're going to get the money for the materials and what quantity of materials are going to be required. All of them are going to come down later on. So if you begin this line, remember that we have a, a, a result chain. This is a better from, I, you know, I didn't want to do a PowerPoint presentation because it would have been clearer for you where to see. So at the beginning you have goal. Then the next one is one, two, or three objectives that will deliver those goals. Then you move to the next stage. Program one, program two for the first objective. Program four, five, six for the second objective. Program seven, eight for the third objective. Then you move to the next one. If you have a program, you have to have projects that deliver a program. So project one, project two, project three are delivering program one. So, and then when you have this program, you then have the next step. So what are the activities in each project? Activity. You are going to train how many students? Okay, and then, you know, and if you train them, what is the result? The output will be certificate, isn't it? The number of people train, the output will be certificates. And then what is the after certificate, which is output? What will be the impact? Is a better person? Is a qualified person? Is a professional? So there's a there's a is a continuous stream of of you know objective, program, project, activities. What the activities produce, and then what the impact you can meet, and then what are the criteria? What the performance criteria that we are going to use? So you can't miss it. If you have it, you didn't do it. And then when you want to now have a monitoring and evaluation framework, you want to become the framework for monitoring. Because the monitoring is going to say you, uh, uh, they say that you know, the only three students that they didn't get. It. So the, the way you score is only three out of 100, so 3% is what they got. So you can now measure and monitor. And you have monitoring points, you have milestones, you have, you know, you can't, it's no longer telling new stories. You have, you have ways to measure what has happened, and when you can measure something, then you can change them. And that's, that's where you come to results uh, uh, change. So that's, that, that's my answer to your guy, is that if you have this framework, it is not possible. Everybody, every level of the university administration have what they have to deliver. Every teacher has what to deliver. Every student has what to do. Everybody, and you can measure it. And then, in fact, you know what happens? When people know what you are measuring them against, you get a better person, a better reaction. You understand? And then also, you have what we call incentive systems. Because if you don't measure, how can you incentivize? 
If you set your incentive that once you achieve 70% of the target, then there's an incentive that will kick in. And if they don't achieve, they don't get the incentive. So we do that incentive system. But of course, when you put all these set off, you have to come to the human beings that we are going to use. And then you say, oh, what are the skills implications of all of these things we now say we are going to do? And that will enable you know how to program the staff. What kind of training is required for them to operate at this level and that level? So you can now plan for their development. Then you now know what kind of teams are we going to have because we work in teams. So, and if you have to work in teams, you have to look at team building issues. So are you going to build their confidence? Are you going to build the team? And then what kind of leadership do you need for this particular team? Leadership is a very, very evolving concept and dynamic. So there's no such thing as one size fits all. Some are situational, some are kind of, and then what kind of, how do I motivate this my team? That's how motivation issue comes in. Leadership issue comes in. Strategic management is what I have been talking about all along. Then you break it down. So you know, so you know how you map your plan, then you look at the resources, your human resource, how you're gonna make them optimize their contribution and tune your staff and make sure that you motivate them and then you know so then you come to the technology and physical resources. If the infrastructure is not there in good time, you will be able to deliver the object. And then if you don't have technology, if the technology is updated, then you have to you know, review and update the technology, which is what is happening in the country. Most of the technologies are all updated and I can't see people saying they do have good technology upgrade. Nobody talks about that. They all talk about buying new equipment, buying new equipment because they're going to make their cut from buying new equipment and they fight and they dump it and other things. So that's my answer to that. That there is a system and procedures that can deliver what we want to achieve. The issue is spend 60% of the time planning these things. And once you plan them, they, you, they'll go on autopilot. And then the people who measure will be there to measure. The people who lead will lead. The people who ensure. That, that's my answer to that. Thank you. I respect all protocol. My name is Dr. G. O.K. Oman, Associate Dean of Faculty of Power. I've observed that productivity in Nigeria is affected by compensation to workers. It is clear that when you pay a worker very well, the worker will do greater jobs. I will give an example. In the public service, those working in Central Bank of Nigeria, those working in the NNPC, those working in the military, are paid more than the teachers in the federal schools in Nigeria. And you find out that they produce more a CPM staff will not like to lose his job, but a teacher in the Federal College of Education, a Hamufu, may be selling sweet and granite in the office to make up for his pay or her pay. So my comment is that productivity has to do with the pay system in Nigeria. If you go overseas, somebody earning dollars will never joke with his job because he knows the worth of the dollar. But in Nigeria, the minimum wage cannot transport a worker from his home to his workplace for one month. So I want us to note that when we write textbooks on productivity, and we don't emphasize the role of the employer in making sure that the pay is realistic, the literature may not go far. Thank you very much. You know, in the UK, I'm spent for one year in the United Kingdom, and I noticed that, you know, pay structures are about, you know, you, you pay people for the value of what they give to you. Let me just give one simple example of surprise. We have a problem in getting teachers to teach in primary schools in the UK. And I have served in the Home Office as a director for some years. And I know that our people don't even know that the easiest way to come in and get four years is to come as a primary school teacher to teach science or math or something. They will give you, within four years, you can bring four children and your husband or whoever claims to be your husband 
going on here at Godfrey Okoye University. It's been so educational and interactive. Lectures have been given by different people from different walks of life. It's been fascinating, intriguing, really, really, really impactful. It's all about productivity and creativity, about development of productivity. In times like this when people tend to be idle, this lecture encourages people to be productive. It's very essential and the importance of productivity is being displayed today here at this venue. The book is a must read. I would tell you that Productivity Development Book by Engineer Henry is a must read. Let's go back into the hall and have more of the phone and learn more about productivity development. It goes to Prof. I mean, it was a wonderful presentation. I was, uh, I was like receiving lectures those days when some profs come to teach. Uh, it is to prof because uh, I'm starting from the CBN, right? You're yeah, from the CBN, sir. And the okay, fine. And the CBN man is there. Yeah, yes. Fine. Uh, the question I want to ask productivity development, but my, let me just capitalize applied productivity development because I'm in the industry. And uh, it is the application of the productivity development I want to ask about. As it concerns, you, you talked about farming uh, initially. Uh, well, I'm from the farming sector. Okay. Uh, right now, my farmers, we have need for some inputs. And those inputs are not readily available in the country. I've decided I want to fly them in. Seeds. Castor seeds. We have the castor seeds by the chain. We have a factory in Enugu that want to start producing castor seed oil. The CBN we've interacted on a couple of occasions. Now, I need to bring in pest resistant castor seeds from India. Unfortunately, most of our the research so far here, we don't have those seeds yet. Now I've come to three or four of my bankers. I'm just needing some small foreign exchange to get this thing, to fly this thing in. And they are telling me in the next six months you can't get that twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Go to bid for you. Uh, uh, they will show me files of people they've been bidding for for the past six months for probably some change dollars. Now, how do I do that? You also talked about 10,000 Naira per hectare plowing. Please, I want to know where that's available in Enugu here. Because last year, uh, I dealt with the Ministry of Agriculture here. The tractors I see there are over 20 years old. They don't have any sound engineering department that 
repairs those tractors. When they break down, they start going to cap a uh, 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 minis. Okay? So, I am looking at, from my experiences last year, I'm looking at, okay, bringing those inputs here. I want to get in my tractors for my farmers. But if I can't get $20,000, if I need to wait six months to bid, my bank has to bid and get $20,000, how do I get the dollars to bring in the tractors? Thank you. I want to start on the existing protocols. You have been experiencing all these uh, things you said now. If you have not the Ministry of Agriculture, have you come to the Development Finance Office? Let me tell you, back to you. Have you come, have you come to the Development Finance Office? For us to work together and visit together and think out together. Okay, uh, we worked with Henry before he left. I have met you at the stakeholders' uh, meeting. Have you met me in my office? You met me at stakeholders' meeting. Have you met me in my office? Oh, hi! Okay. That is also one of the reasons I'm here. I was told that the CPN governor or whoever is going to be here. So if you are asking me to come to your office, then I will take you to your office. Samples of economies of production. So, what the economies of production is, is for example, if you are going to do maize, and then, I mean, maize is usually between 200 and 250,000, uh, let's suppose that the, the road you are applying for, you have 1,000 farmers who are going to grow maize, and you are going to aggregate, right? So, each one of them, there will be 250,000. Uh, so, what you see is and then we we'll just put this up by the side, the land clear is not in the issue. So, so when the land clear is one, because the variance depends on where it is, the vegetation and all that, and the agroecology. So you come to this first section, which is mechanization services providers. Under that, we are going to see three lines plowing, harrowing, and weeding. If you are doing this, you may not need weeding. You know, some people don't, they just need to. You know, they say, why do I have it? Well, I can just reach about so, But when you look at the, the formula, you see per unit per, per hectare. You see the allocation is 10,000 naira per hectare for that activity, 10, 10, 10. Right? So, you may pay that 30,000 and the person just comes, does that, does that, does that, and do the We have service providers, see, we tell you who they are. We have NAMEL, we have uh, AHO. Uh, and then we have, there are, there are many, I can give you some names. These people have national uh, 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 chain of equipment hiring agents that work with them located in different parts of the country. Each one may have about 500 uh, agents and all that, they are in all states. And so we can supply you with these of those who we know and who are doing, going around doing that. Now, but the thing is this. If you are doing 50 hectares or 30 hectares, is it worth you buying, buying a tractor? You don't have to address that. Because you can't buy a tractor with all the headache in it. You do, if they do one month of your thing, and then they're going to lie out for 11 months. Go and work out the mathematics. Because I remember there was one day I was in a meeting, you know, I, I facilitated 10,000 hectares. 10,000 tractors from John Depp from the Ministry of Agriculture and then we launched it. But I remember one of the meetings, then the first man came. He said uh, that this thing that they did in Calabar and uh, uh, Cross River State, that they did so many thousands of hectares, they had the equipment. The equipment that they had was even bigger than the Julius Becker. That's the tractor that you do that and all that. that. That they were even bigger than Julius Becker, just to clear farm and all that. And at the end of the day, all those things, they all the just buy like that. So they now take it a bitter experience. How many billion that they have put in bringing those hundreds of things that they didn't pay everything back. So they say they prefer this thing we are trying to do. It's cheaper for them. Somebody else carries the burden. He just comes in one day, book, we book him, comes one day, and they can do four hectares in a day. But your own, you know, so you just, you just come, do that little bit, go get the girl out of your way. Then in your plan, you will see the seeds, how much the seed, how many kilograms of maize, hybrid seed that they are going to put, or rice, 
in our case of our Africa, what are the kilos that we want to supply to this human And uh, there are so many kilograms, more than six or seven or eight kilograms, that are in per hectare. So the amount is there, it's 400 naira per hectare. I don't know what it is now. So, and then if it is made, it's how much? Then for the fertilizer, NPK fertilizer, four kilograms or four bags per hectare. And this is a bag, I think it would not have been 10,000, now it should be 7,000, 8,000. Made as four. Then you have the uh, urea. I don't know what it is now, whether it's gone to 11 times two. two so you can see the money, you see all the money. Then you will come to the section of in, uh, insurance. I told you it's 2% tonight. Tonight is not tonight insurance. Naive. 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 Yeah, sorry. Then you have uh, extension support, 25,000. Then you have habits, that is for clearing, coming to collect your thing. I got about 15,000. But there is a section that is your own money, you the farm. The money you will get because all the other ones are flying over your head. But they would pay, they would pay them until you say that you have received the service. Is it not? Excellent. So you are still in control. Because you are not taking. Now you will get maybe ten thousand naira per hectare for planting the, the thing yourself. Maybe ten thousand naira for administering your fertilizer. Maybe 10,000 naira per hectare for applying your herbicides. Labor related amount. Labor related. That's your own money now. Because I feel that you're giving the labor. You understand? So you will get that maybe 50,000 or 60,000. So you see it, which is your own. For farm maintenance, you see your own, your own there. So you will collect that one for the work you are going to do. Then when you see all that, and then you see how it goes. But the whole of that 250,000, you will see it. Then there, and then nobody will take your money. So that's what you are exposed to. If you want to now, instead of 250,000 naira per hectare, you want a 50 million naira, you go and buy tractor. That's a different program. It's no longer this anchor growers. Uh, uh, this is not just a community commodity model. Because the community commodity model, we are taking it slow. Remember, they are not paying more. They, we don't have, we are not taking it to that other from them. So we just keep it into one man, one hectare, da, da, da. But you can come on a different baby program, I could go what called prime anchors. If you come in as a prime anchor, you are saying that I'm a businessman, I need two billion from you, I'm going to use one billion to get all the equipment I need, I'm going to build the factory for 500 million, and then the other 500 million, I'm going to use it to do 200 hectares. It is alright. Come on, they'll give you the money. But you're going to bring the collector. I, am, I, am I correct? You're going to bring collector now. So if it's up, and then off take it, who's going to off take it? If you say you're going to off take it because you're going to build factory there as well, and then do this, fine. So, you know, there's a different program. And then we also have other programs. We have RT $200 billion that I've spoken about this of many TV programs, where we have five sub these things there. And then we also have 100 for 100 PPP, where you say, okay, we are giving up to five billion dollar naira per person per company on, on 100 for 100 per company. There's also it's for processing processing area. That's where we are putting that. So we have massive program based on anchor growers for growing the things. Then we have a hundred for hundred PPP, which is for processing and manufacturing. Then we have RT 200 billion dollar, which we want to force it out for export. And then so many incentives are built into that. Thank you. I had to introduce myself because I want to say that I'm a very lay man in what is being discussed. So you will forgive me if I make terrible mistakes. Um, my impression in this country is that the more money people earn, the less they work, the less output they give. And I was surprised that the associate team was talking about the NNPC. What output has NNPC given to Nigeria <laughs> with all the money you pay them in the salary? Uh, Prof. Ken, <laughs> it is either, I have the impression that either you, uh, the central bank is not consulting you well, or you are not offering the central bank an efficient consultancy service. How can we be talking about central bank in Nigeria when our whole currency is in a mess 
over the years. What is happening? What, what do you want us to feel that you have a central bank and your money is worth practically nothing in the world? I'm talking about dollars, I'm talking about whatever. And those, those who are working in this country are the people who earn the least, inclusive the teachers. There are the people who are making great effort to train people. The ask is on strike. What's in the debate? Facilities to beef up the, uh, the schools. Go to our schools from every level to the highest. The, the, the common needs uh, for uh, running a good program in most universities are not even available. And the teachers are the least paid. They make noise, then they keep quiet and continue their work. And I would like to know really uh, what is happening to this country uh, around those of you who know how to uh, be productive and manage funds and even make them available to the people for productivity. Thank you very much. But let me begin from where you began. You called NNPC. I want to diagnose NNPC in the context of your question. Now, we have, you know, if we didn't borrow so much money and then the whole country was shaking on the issue of their sustainability, if we didn't, maybe the government may not have had that course to sign that BIAP. They may have allowed it to continue their job. But go back to the case, we have been working on it. Yeah, PIA, PIA, and all that. In the end of the day, we have to sign it. Now, let me tell you the impact of signing it. The impact of signing it is we now have a chance in hell to get out of it. We now have a chance. And let me tell you one, one thing about the chance. There's always issues. I do a lot of debate on debt sustainability of this country. And I've always believed that, you know, we have yardsticks um, where 40% is like, I mean, Fiscal Responsibility Act 2007 is the law that governs lending, borrowing, and all that in this country. And in fact, I better shock you, anything called borrowing is on the exclusive legislative list. Any of any day when he wakes up and wants to send all the governors to prison, they will just go and get your agenda and go and enforce the act. And all of them will be working there. Because even to get overdraft, which is lengthy, the law allowed, we must get clearance from the federal government. Because anything about borrowing and that is on the exclusive exclusive list. And when you look at uh, that 2007, uh, uh, 2007, 2007, it tells you borrowing has to be on capital expenditure only and human resource development. No more. We didn't put recurrent, uh, we didn't put anything else, we didn't put salary, we didn't put anything else. Those are the only of course, in human resource development, you will have uh, health, education, and employment as the major, three major components of human resource development. So, whoever is borrowing money to pay salary is, is working his way to jail. Which is come down. All right. Now you come down. Say, what is the realistic? The law only allows three percent for your deficit to GDP. But you know we've exceeded it, and then we moved it up to four percent. The strong. The law did not set the limit for debt to GDP, domestic or foreign. It didn't set limit for debt service to government revenue. That should be about 40%. The actual lending uh, borrowing should be no more than 40% of your GDP. But we are doing 22% with 2.5% today. So, what am I saying? There is a lot of issue there. And then when you look at why, uh, why is the country shaking on our debt, it's because our borrowing has only been debt finance. Debt finance. Everybody knows what we owe, but nobody knows what we have. Or what we owe. Everyone knows what we owe. And so when you come to balance sheet, in balance sheet you have your assets and then you have your liability. If your asset is more than your liability, 
they are, they are suffering. But when your assets are less than your liability, you are insolvent. And people are seeing only those. Now, Saudi Arabia needed 25 billion dollars. They didn't want to go and borrow up to World Bank or IMF. They said, you know what? What is the value of an Aram? Aram? Biggest oil company in the world owned by them. I want to know. They did a valuation, they found that it was 1.5 billion dollars. He said, I have that kind of money. But you have to sell 5% of it. 5% they floated and they got 25 billion that they needed. Is Nigeria's asset known? Are they in any book? We don't. So if we are going to, if all our borrowing is just debt, debt, debt financing, then we are in trouble because everybody is going to be shaking about you know, potential uh, crash anytime. But if you have some finances that are capital, uh, you know, you know, if, if, you are, if you are looking, if you are looking at the capital or if you want to call it equity, equity finance, then it's a different story. But for you to bring equity financing. We need to know the value of your asset, your company, your whatever they own. You have to know what is value. And put it in the international account. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a member of, there are five of us, a member of the committee that was set up by the federal government called to, 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 to reform Ministry of Finance Incorporated. Now, what is more? Every P, paper, table, owned by any branch of government all over the world belongs to the Ministry of Finance Incorporated. All of them. So we own thousands of companies. We just gave 840 to BPP to do and all that stuff. When the company owns all that, we will be having a, a handshake with all the big directors. We want to tell them where we are going. We want to reform. We want to value all these assets and we want to put them up, either for sale or for leverage. Because once you know that the asset of the country is X, Y, Z, then people can buy into them and have a business. And then that brings what does that mean to NNPC? That's where I'm going. NNPC has now become a private company registered by CAC. Now, remember, the moment they just registered, they told Afrex in, we need one. Afrex in carry $5 billion and came to them and gave them. Would they have done it a day before? No way. They now know, they know, Afrex didn't know that these guys that are now private company sit on huge assets. So give them 5 billion, what's 5 billion? If they ask for 10 billion, they'll give them 10 billion. But let me take to the next one about NMPC. NMPC every month, because I'm now going to link NMPC to CBN. Every month, NMPC ought to be sending us $3 billion every month. And when CBN receives that, some of it will, will increase our lot reserves. Some of them they will still take back to pay for the exportation of their thing and put their return back. But for the whole of last year, the whole of last year, not one penny, not one dollar come from them to see the center. Okay. So if you are not giving us the money you are earning, which is about 70% of the forex revenue, how then do you expect us to give you the money that we want for that, for that, for that? Where the money will come from? And we need dollar to service the dollar denominated debts. Government is insecure. And we need dollar to give you your PTA, PTA, and all that medical thing. We need, we need dollar. We are not getting anything from the next. So, if I'm going to round it up, the government should wait. <coughs> Let us put NNPC in the, the PLC. Let's put it out there in the PLC. Because once it is voted, we will have to value the assets first. If you value the assets of, uh, of NNPC now and they come to 30 trillion naira, eh? If it is value at 32 million naira, and government says, well, what am I doing 32 million naira? Look, I need 30% of this money. I know I can do 50%, but 30 times 30 million is how much? 90 million overnight. Just by giving 30% share to individuals. Government will can take down 90 million and stop what it's doing. Pay off what it's doing. So, NFPC is great. We are waiting for NFPC to go to the market. You will see how all our problems will start overnight. It was that what happened in 2005? We found money, we paid 18 billion, and then got a $12 billion uh, rebate, and then we, see, we ended this whole panic of uh, So, that is that. Then you come to the question about uh, CBN.
And I'm going to talk to one of the things, CDN. So the reason why NFPC has not sent money to CDN is because they did a direct crude swap with the people who are refining the product. So they send the crude and then they send us back to PMS. And then they are not back it. Unpack it. The crude price has gone up to one hundred dollars. Then the computer, the transportation cost has gone up. The processing cost has also gone up. The return to transportation has gone up. And then you put the match on it. Who is playing you? Well, we are told it was 1.2 uh, trillion subsidy. But when the chief we are down and the NEC got involved, they now know that it's actually 30 million. <laughs> but we don't know the real figure. The subsidy, we don't know the real figure. My solution is let's put NFPC in the, in the capital market. That will force us to come value NFPC and we grow the value of it. Once the value is known, we go for quotation. We just need this as well. My question is um, about our youth and what is happening to our young people in terms of training and preparation to become productive. Um, I had an experience yesterday, just coming in at the airport, at Tenugu, uh, our own international airport here, with a few bags, and with someone to help me to roll my bag out of the airport, and they did. And by the time I was entering into my car, I was surrounded by 10 men who were asking for tips. One person or two rolled out the bag, but ten people were gathered to ask for tips. And my question for them was, what did you produce that you want to be paid for? And if you look at our economy, and look, that's what our world has become. People want to earn money without doing anything. And I think it has to do with the university, the way we teach, the way our professors are raising our, you know, the students. I came to uh, Godfrey because of uh, my professor that uh, the VC, his motto then was show me the evidence. That attracted me and that, I mean, as a scientist I came with hands-on laboratory teaching just to change the way students think and so they can begin to solve problems in agriculture, even COVID and all of that because they can do science, not just memorize science. So I would like to know what CBN and other uh, stakeholders are doing to change the way training is done in our universities. So we can produce a generation that can actually produce something and not just pass exams. So Prof, over to you. Our young people, people under the age of 35 years, are 75% of our population. Which means that about 165 million people are youth, young people under that age. When you compare our population to the European Union, you find out that we have twice more people in this band than the European Union. So what does that tell you? It tells you that industries that want to do well should be heading towards that segment to produce for them. And education is a very good industry that should go for that group. Alright. And second, second thing is that the unemployment in the country, the average unemployment is 35%. Is it not? 33.5%. Okay. But when you look at that group, under 35 years, the unemployment rate for them is 50%. And then the underemployment is 22%. So when you add them together, these guys are 72%. On the streets, not finding what to do. But when you take education institutions, educational institutions like university, only seven percent of what comes out of your university actually gets job. So ninety-three percent can't find job. Now we may have to have a bigger debate where we are going to analyze what this means because you know this is this beats every other statistics. We're going to have to look at the quality of education. We have to look at the, the, the relationship between uh, what we call industry education partnership. We need there's a lot of stuff to be looked at. There's a lot, a lot of stuff. I remember one day when they said Professor Kuche, he was the NEC, NEC, NEC boss, 
I sent out to him one day, I think it was like in the year 2000 or something. Me and Tito, we were in London addressing it was Nigerian Independence Day. So he just took out to speak and he was an unpastor, this private university, private university. And then I, I, then, I then took back from the, the commissioner, the high commissioner, I said, I'm going to apply this guy. And I told him, um, I told him, uh, I'm doing on the first So when he feels that, he did take my proposal. So I said, well, you know, you only have 140 universities in Nigeria. Only half of it are private. And you are making a move out of this. And I said, look, America is 30, 300 million people. Nigeria is 200 million people. How many universities have America? America has 2,600 universities. I'm talking about 140 universities. What it tells you, they don't need 2,600 universities to train their workforce. They are business, it's business. They are training the whole world. China has 2.4 million, 2.6 million people studying in America any one time. So it's business. You have to see this as a business. So when private sector have to come in, you are not funding the, 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 your, your own the federal establishment. And the private sector that have to bring in their resources to help. They are castigating them, getting them locked up and all that stuff. They have to adopt a developmental approach. And then build that capacity. They have to show that you know, give them an enabling environment and supporting them so that they can invest their money. If they don't invest in this business, it will continue to deteriorate. Again, it's part of a story from another perspective. I want to shock you now. Ban Ki Moon, who was the US Secretary General in 2000, said that we need 30% more food by the year 2030. And when he said that, the climate change took part of the UN, says him that the world will produce 30% less food in 2030 because of climate related changes. Then when you come down to Nigeria, our population by 2030 will be 300 million people. The average age of our farmer is 65 years old. So a lot of us who are past 65, we are all on, we are all on uh, in the body land. Some have got their body pass. Some have got their The being faculty of natural sciences and environmental studies. Now my question is this. We are talking of productivity, and at the same time, we are saying what is the end result. I want us to think, have a picture of oil hungering in Nigeria. Here are young men who have gone to college, uh, college of technology, schools of technology, and have developed means of fabricating instruments and equipment and are drilling oil. And they are pushing it out and people are buying it at a very cheap rate. At the same time, they are causing health hazards by blowing the suit, which is affecting the people in Portacourt, so it's a health challenge. Now, we go to those places, we destroy the technology. We destroy them. They are not doing anything. Is it not proper for productivity that they should be harnessed put into those refineries that are more important and that are not being repaired and we make good use of them than letting them go and then reduce the health hazard that everybody is suffering from. I want to make it very brief. Thank you. There are certain things I advise government. But you know they're slow though. I can tell you that government listens to me. Even though sometimes they, they do the things. I've argued many years ago. I continue to argue. Why don't you have amnesty? If, if over 600 billion dollars of our money are out there, why don't you have amnesty? Give them a window of what, two years or three years, they bring it incentivize. If CBN gets 100 billion dollars, you know what happens? Our reserves show you 100 billion dollars. Everybody will be jumping to lend money to you because they give money to somebody who has money. <laughs> and you give them even zero interest. Take it. If he has it. Hmm? And then you can solve problems. I don't forget to the fact that you have this man sitting there. It's just like if you raise a standby level of credit, you can actually not use money, but raise money to fund three times that money to fund your projects. Hmm? Now, coming to your listing. One of the other things I keep saying is 
Why do we have double standards? In Zamfara, we have a small man of everywhere. Yes. But then, if you have about $3 billion there, it's not efficient in our coffers. And you don't see anything about that small mining. After all, whoever is mining anything is bringing out solid, solid uh, heavy metals out into the surface. The rain washes them, it's pollution. We pollute all the waters. You're killing people. Some of them are cyanide, zinc, and all that. They're killing people. The same hazard that we have in Port Harcourt area of all this. So I say, regularize these people, register them, and put an inspection framework on them so that they can see them grow and develop and then get better equipment. That will give them time. So all those artisanal miners that are, they are only existing because of supply gap. Because you have a government owned refinery where you pour money. Okay. I ask the question, why are you spending $3 billion in trying to get uh, these three people to work, uh, any piece of refinery to work? Why are you spending that? When you have modular refineries, each of them are central modular refineries, each modular refinery producing to the, the, uh, the refining 20,000 barrels a day costs $75 million. The highest cost is $100 million because you don't need catalytic compact because we are, our source is low. But each month, you use 1.2 trillion naira to subsidize this fuel. Each refinery costs 35 billion naira. The money you have built for refineries, by the end of the month, we have about 48, 50 refineries. And this is borrowed money, which they will repay. You don't have to waste our money. I put these arguments out there. And you know, even when I finish arguing on the tele, I still write my memo to the ministers. We don't need to do it. We should be doing this. And I get it that they're going to raise it. They're going to do that. They're actually working on that. But I keep talking about it. All right? Now, I told you, your artisanal refiners, your artisanal refiners, do you know the contradiction? The contradiction is that the, first of all, why will the artisanal you know what they call political economy? The political economy is the level of interest of private people and small units. When those interests supersede national interest, it's political economy. So if you go to airports, ah, you want to go and start a new custom bus, you're going to stop this. They will kill you. They will kill you all. Kill you. You go to the seaport and say you want to go to Lagos seaport, Papa, you're going to change it. They'll kill the person before it comes out. Every woman who is sending drama, but whatever that be, they will touch that person, some thoughts will come for you before the end of the month. Because all the retired people in coastal, they are doing the help of these businesses. They are other people, everything is still. So <laughs> as far as I'm thinking, they go and build new one. Just go in our F, 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 whatever, 200, and they go and do new things. In our 100 for 100 PPP, 80% of the manufacturing companies in Nigeria import all their raw materials. The, the pharmaceuticals, all of them import active from certain ingredients. So, how are you going to find them? They are going to say, no, I'm not going to give you. Over Sanjo tried it now. The, 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 the beer, he said, this brewery, how can brewery? The drinking drunk is the biggest industry in Nigeria. About the ones have twenty percent of your bar must be so good. Then we check and then then you say bread. Ah, look at how much flour you have to eat. You must put cassava into the thing. Then they do all that. Then you want to come out the door down to. So for you to come and think you're going to the military man didn't do it well. Then you won't go civilian. Just go and create a new program. You cannot come and say to all these people who are that you're not going to give them foreign exchange again until they now start with their uses. Just go and create a new program. And that new program is 100 for 100 PPP. If you want money, we will give you up to 5 billion. Hmm? 100 businesses will be given money in 100 days. That's about 360 of them can get money in a year. And that means times 5 billion, we are putting 1.7 trillion now to say, Come on, come and take this money, but you can only take it if you are going to employ 80% of your workforce, minimum of the Nigerians. Two, all the raw materials should be at least 50% of them from Nigeria. So, they are creating a new vista so that you can keep your sanity. 
Eh? You don't get into the kill you. Okay. Find the fuel that they produce and use it to blend what they want. And they pay the money some five percent of it of what they would cost. So they are buying it at a discounted rate. And what that produces that alternated because they have every condensate in it. All this water and condensate, you know, condensate is not purified. The petroleum, there's a condensate in that, but they are carrying the whole thing and mix it and put it into the supply chain. So, in fact, the first question I asked, the first interview that I had when they died, I said, Can you find out whether it was as a result of the one they collected from people that they mixed? Nobody wants to follow up on that. I asked, we'll call it the man. If it is the man that did it from uh, Belgium, the first person that you should be interrogating is the man that blended the thing for you. Because they are refined and they are blended with people. Is it the these people who are just carriers, uh, MRS and what? They are only carriers, they are just going to collect it. They are, they are calling their names. Are they the one that blended? Is the one that blended it in, 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 in process that you should say, my friend, why did you put so much methanol, uh, ethanol into this? That's the person you should be talking to. They don't want to talk about that. Yes. So put your hands What's forward. Uh, and take instructions from me now. That's it. Uh, again. Then touch the glove. Yellow glove. So, uh, we are going to uh, do this. Uh, what I mentioned, the last nature of our Savior, Jesus, the Lord God. Okay? And I said time. So, J E S U S. So you take a copy. Congratulations. So you take a copy. Thank you. So beautiful. Uh, on behalf of uh, the management, principal officers of our university, we will take a, a copy of this for the sum of 100,000 naira.
Prof have asked me to launch uh, because of insecurity. I won't say my own publicly. The amount, professor, professor, if I am one name, Please, I don't Okay, I can, okay, engineer, okay, I should not call my kind of people. Oh, no, 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 And that people sitting here say, he's launching with a sum of 20,000. So I'm launching with a sum of 10,000 naira. Thank you, sir, God bless you. Please, to end that for OPM, Nigerian meeting, sir. Dr. Cletus Marco. Dr. Cletus is launching uh, a friend and brother to the water. So yeah. I want you to make a sum of 10,000 naira cash. So it's not too good. 10,000 naira cash. Thank you. successful man there is a woman and standing next to me here is the wife of the author of the book productivity development I want to say that I I know what motivated my husband to write the book today earlier this year or rather some time ago anyway we had a set of staff okay we had a set of staff that we didn't know we are very unproductive until we evaluated them to check their productivity okay it was at the point of that evaluation that we noticed that this staff we are very unproductive from day to day week to week month to month they will do nothing but when you come around you see them busy you know you see them very busy it's not like you see them idling out they are busy but when you ask them what have you achieved per day what have we achieved per month what have we achieved per... nothing to show for it so it was on that note that he sat down and wrote down what it would take for individuals for a family for families for institutions for business owners for companies to be able to evaluate take inventory of the activities of their staff and their own personal activities to be able to find out whether they are being productive or not. And may I use this opportunity to say a very big thank you to every individual that made out the time to come here today. I know it's a very difficult time. People engage with so many things, but they still found out time, they still made out time to come today to honor this invitation. We we'll say may God bless them immensely. May, oh, may God reward them in all the ways, and whatever it is that they have lost by spending the time with us here. May God replenish them hundredfold in Jesus' name. And may God guide them back to their destinations in Jesus' name. I'm very pleased to actually manage to make it today and to be a keynote speaker. Very excited at the responses and the kind of questions that came back. Very challenging questions. And I talked at great length on what productivity improvement means to private sector and even also to public organizations. But uh, I'm, I'm happy at the response and the level of interest 
as shown by the, the, the people in the audience, the businesses in the audience. I think, to be honest with you, this is the way to go. This country has suffered for so long from a lack of productivity approach to our economic development. And, uh, and I thank Henry for the work, the excellent work that he has done, not only in producing the, the text, but also having the, the workbook to go with it. And I thank the professor, the vice chancellor, Professor Nieke, tremendous man, you know, to have supported this course and have spent all this time here encouraging, very, very encouraging. So, I, on, on, on average, I think this is 10 over 10. You know, I, I like to say that this is excellent. Uh, it's been a very wonderful thing. Professor Ken Ife did a good job. It's about productivity. It's about how you measure productivity. When you are in an establishment like this, like Godfrey Korean University, you want to know whether you're actually making progress and how you measure your progress and how you can convince people that you're making progress. So what uh, this uh, summit has achieved is to give us a consciousness of measuring achievement productivity with a view to improving our productivity. So I would like to congratulate Henley for making it possible for us to enjoy this intellectual festival and for making it possible for us to have Ken Eve for the first time in the university. It's a very good thing for me and for members of staff of our university. You know, when I employ you in the university, I want you to show that my, I have not wasted my time. Okay? I had an interview and uh, I made up my mind to employ him and he's the director of continuing education. So he has not disappointed. It shows again that my decision to employ him is, is the right one. Uh, what I wish them to get is planning life. Planning their life, setting out goals, setting out means of achieving their goals and measuring what they have set out to do. That's actually what makes the difference between somebody who is educated and someone who is not. Somebody who is educated will be doing things without knowing why and the outcome and the result and all that. But an educated person will take some time to plan and then set out goals, measure the, the outcome and then say, okay, I continue or I need some change. That's actually what the whole education is all about. I want to believe that my students are learning. I learned a lot from productivity today because I asked a pertinent question on oil bunkering. Because we have the brain, the young ones who are into fabrication and who are applying that science that is required for productivity. And then they are being wasted. At the same time, they are being allowed to pollute the air and they are not being harnessed and used. So it's very pertinent question because if we believe in productivity, those young boys and girls and whosoever they are should not be allowed to be wasted. They should do the production of both fabricating the equipment, fabricating the required uh, materials and dishing out the product at the end of the day. And then there will be less need for refineries. So refineries will be a thing of the past. Mr. Henry, congratulations and thank you for anchoring what you did today. It's great and thank you very much. We want to have you again next time. To sit down and gather material to write a book is not so easy. I've tried to put down something in book and discover how difficult it is. It takes a man with patience. If you, are, if you don't have patience, you cannot write a book. But if he can do that, he needs to be stand with and uh, participate in what he's doing to encourage him to do more. Because whoever, no matter, even if it's a line that somebody can put in a paper, the person needs to be encouraged because I know how difficult it is to do that. We are glad to be here. Uh, it's a feather on his cap. It's also a feather on the cap of the uh, chamber. And, uh, people who will read this and know him will know the quality of staff we have in the chamber. And uh, if they are impressed with what they will read in the book, they will also extend that impression to the chamber. Uh, more than that is also the fact that I am the legal advisor to the Southeast Chambers of Commerce and uh, Henry is also the part-time DG of uh, uh, the Southeast Chambers of Commerce. So is a, I have a, double, a dual role more or less to play here but all of them center around the man 
the, uh, the writer of the book. So it is, it's an auspicious occasion for me. I'm glad to be here. I first of all want to congratulate him for such a brilliant outing and the level of um, um, academics that he brought together to elucidate us on productivity and monitoring and evaluation. i very glad I came for this function. He promised to be a very, very uh, interesting function and it's not anything short of that. I'm sure nobody is going to leave this um, quite educative uh, function without um, having a very good uh, commentary for this. I recommend this book and this level of interaction from time to time in our academia um, so that we can actually find solution to the teaching problems of our economy. The level of, the, of uh, talk and discussions that happened here today was quite insightful. So I'm very glad I'm part of this event. Thank you. I came in here and uh, I uh, suddenly became uh, uh, the chairman. Uh, because the substantive chairman was unavoidably absent. So um, I welcomed uh, all those that uh, were able to attend. Because um, these days there are so many uh, events militating against our time. So for those who were able to make it, I congratulated them. And also congratulated um, Engineer Henry Ndoka. Aweregu, the Director General of um, SMA, and also the Director of uh, this project for launching his book. And his book is uh, well recommended to all tertiary institutions, to SMEs, to all entrepreneurs, captains of industry, because time management is there, productivity is there, and, and how to make use of your money is there. How to maximize your productivity, your time, time management, all covered there. So we thoroughly enjoyed um, uh, listening to Professor Ken Ife. He's a rare he, he spoke so well. We learned a lot from him and his colleagues. And so I'm, I'm thoroughly grateful for this event. Thoroughly grateful to the university, especially the vice chancellor, Professor um, Anieke, Christian Anieke. My children will need to study the book and apply the book. It is a book made practical. I actually came in I know the engineer Henry and his, uh, his friend, is, uh, we, we work in close uh, uh, partnership and so on because the chamber of the, the DJ of Chamber of Commerce, we've been around here. When you talk about productivity uh, development, it's one of the things that uh, is very key in the present day Nigeria. We have to you know, enhance your productivity, we also have to develop what, from where we also be. You know, we in the non-oil ex export sector, we, we believe that uh, we need to do a bit more to be able to improve the non-oil uh, earnings. Oil has failed, oil is not more the in thing. So in any other way, innovation and productivity is very key in the development of the non oil sector in the country. That's why I'm here. This event is wonderful. I've learned quite a lot, especially from the keynote speaker, Professor Kenife, and the host of the Vice Chancellor is doing a marvelous work here. And uh, I think I think this should be like a, a pest setter amongst some of the universities around. I was talking to the, I know, you know they have a nanny center here, and they are into all the uh, uh, entrepreneurship development and uh, productivity enhancement. That's one of the things. He's also training the people on uh, handwork, not just in head work, not just the knowledge work, but the handwork. Through my contact, I brought her into this university. So what he did today is like, you have a son who is doing fine. All you need to do is to say kudos to him and I wish him the best. It's a good arrangement. Yes, and we are here with students from Godfrey Okoye University who attended today's event. And we would like to know what they benefited from the event because I am very sure that they learned a lot. So let's hear from the students. 
and this event um i say i would say that i feel so blessed and privileged to have participated because i learned a whole lot and it was really 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 educating a lot of intellectual productivity of course it was focused on productivity development and i'm so happy i attended this event honestly it was a wonderful one beautiful very interesting today's program was so exciting i learned a whole lot Thanks to everyone who made this program come true. I wish to have more of this program. Thank you. Beautiful. beautiful event here at Godfrey Okoye University at the occasion of the International Business and Leadership Summit 2022. We had a great time here. There's been lots of things to learn. People shared their thoughts. Questions were asked. Beautiful answers were given. It was wonderful. It was glamorous. And once again, we are all saying congratulations to Engineer Henry Ndoka. My name is Muna Ezodo. Congratulations, Congratulations, Engineer, Engineer Henry Induka Ewerago.